your level isn't ready, um, but there's part of it's ready, then just drag the player controller to the part of it that's ready. If your enemy spawning isn't set up yet, just drag the enemies into the scene. No one's going to know. <laughs> um, mm. You know, don't be afraid to fake stuff. You know, if you... Um, if you're working on something and you don't have anything to post, just post, um, you know, what you have so far. Like, if I'm adding a new enemy into the game, I don't have him set up yet, but I have his, I have him retextured. I have a few animations for him. I'll say, hey, check out this new enemy I'm working on. And I'll just, you know, put the camera there and then, uh, you know, trigger his animations of him swinging. So it looks like he's he's doing something in the game. And even though he's not a full working enemy, I'm able to, to get that out there. People are saying, hey, that looks awesome. That looks cool. And then... Um, and then you can follow it up. Hey, I got this enemy, you know, finally working. Here's him fighting. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Zero to Play podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jennings. And today I'm joined by Justin Rosetti, Rosette. Um, Justin is the lead developer and CEO of Tab Games and creator of the upcoming Oculus Quest title, Samurai Slaughterhouse. He has been a hobbyist game developer since the age of 10 and has recently begun his own indie studio. In addition to game dev, he specializes in graphic design and is also a musician who enjoys producing all of the music in his games to give them a unique feel. Today, we'll be talking about Justin's journey into game development and going full-time indie, his passion for creating in VR as a space, ask him for advice in indie game marketing, uh, which I need a lot of, and more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode of the Zero to Play uh, podcast. Welcome, uh, Justin, to the show. Uh, thank you for joining me. Definitely. Thanks for having me on. Good to, good to be on, Johnny. Yeah, good times, man. Uh, super excited. Um, so I gotta, I gotta come in hot. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta talk, right? I want to know what your thoughts are, right? Uh, so you create in all sorts of spaces. You can draw. You can uh, write music. Um, I know you're a big movie buff. You know you love your video games, right? And so uh, knowing like all that and knowing all the spaces that you've created in, right? Like, what is it that draws you to VR? Like, what, what, what's the significance of um, your interest in VR? I think um, it's a couple of things. I think one of the biggest things, I mean, I've always loved just like making games, but I kind of uh, never, never thought I could like make a full time job of it. And then mm. when I first started VR, like, first of all, it just blew me away. I was like, this is amazing. It's like I'm in the video games. It's everything I fantasized about as a kid. Like literally I had dreams about being inside like Super Mario and now it's like, you know, you can do it. Like, and uh <laughs> And yeah, so I mean, that was like, that was the one part of it is that, you know, just I love VR, it blew me away. And then the other thing is that it is still kind of like a small space. Um, there's not too many AAA games. The big companies aren't in there muscling everyone out. So, you know, there is room for anyone to, like, has a good idea and, you know, some talent to come in and just kind of make a splash, make a difference. That's what I kind of liked about it was that it wasn't already taken over, oversaturated, like you didn't need a buy a million ads to get someone to notice your game like yeah. you're right you're right absolutely <laughs> yeah different kind of app store and all that right <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's not like you're on the the mobile app store which i'm sure you know about and like the whole thing with there is user acquisition so like with this thing you, can, you don't have to muscle everyone out as much. Right, yeah absolutely absolutely um and i think uh, that serves as a great uh point to like mention samurai slaughterhouse right i'm a big fan i i, I luckily got a chance to try it uh, earlier this week and uh, um you talked about like being in the video game and i think one thing i admire just playing it right is like you did such a good job of like realizing this space and making it making uh facebook calls it or meta they call it presence right but making you feel immersed in the space and so i think you did a phenomenal job so uh so i guess first of all can you tell us a bit about samurai uh, slaughterhouse and kind of um i guess your vision for it uh in the immediate future yeah thanks and uh yeah thanks for that so uh yeah if you guys haven't caught any like videos or captures of it it's uh, or maybe you have you just didn't realize what samurai slaughterhouse but it's the samurai game it looks like it's in black and white it really actually has like subtle color once you get into vr you look at things closely but you know subtle color except for the, the blood which is bright red so <laughs> it's a you know physics-based action game so you know you're able to pull your sword out of the sheath swing it around like use the sharp point you got spears you know throwing stars and a bunch more weapons to come you can you know chuck rocks at people like um so all physics-based combat um, you know, you're able to block the enemy strikes. Um, and on top of that, which is what kind of makes it unique is that it does have, uh, a lot of like RPG features, like kind of light RPG features, 
So you're not, you know, stuck looking at menus all the time, but kind of enough just to get the fun out of it. So there's, you know, branching conversation, dialogues, quests, side quests, NPCs, including friendly NPCs that you can, like, actually recruit and they follow you around and they'll be fighting side by side and, you know, talking trash. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just a lot of fun. And you can, you know, collect resources you use for crafting and buying things. So, uh, you know, just a little bit more in-depth than, like, the normal VR game, which will... You know, be nice. Only a little bit story based, which I think is something that's a, a little kind of missing from VR. Um, a lot of the things are either you know all action based with almost no story, or they're like completely narrative based, um, where it's almost not even a game. It's almost like interactive movie. Which I love both mm-hmm. of those type of experiences, but I think we just need one that's uh, just like a normal video game, like but in mm-hmm. VR. <laughs> You're right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think one of the things um, I was super curious about with uh, Samurai Slaughterhouse, right, is like, I was thinking about your game, and it's really, it's kind of interesting, because your game looks fun, right? Just watching it, people like the moment they see it, they get it. Um, But even like being in a samurai duel, right? Like, I think there's a couple things I imagine you had to balance, right? You had to like figure out how to make uh, sword fighting feel good, right? Um, you had to make sure it like was graphic and kind of um, enjoyable, right? Like it was graphic and it was fun to in- observe and participate in. And then um, like just getting the scene right and everything. So I guess I guess my question is how do you make uh, a compelling sword fighting system and then build like this samurai western uh, environment to like really make it uh, feel engaging? so i did it actually a little bit the other way so i kind of started off with like the visual style so um i was making i don't know the this is the way it started off i was making another roguelike shooter game and it was gonna Mm -hmm. i was adding melee weapons and the melee weapons were fun to like you know play with each other but when Mm -hmm. you try to mesh it with the shooting it just didn't make sense because like you like rush up on the people and then they can't shoot you or you can shoot the the melee enemies and then they you know by the time they get to you they're dead but um you know just the melee was really fun and then at the same time i was trying to come up with different like uh, visual things for different areas and uh, mm-hmm. I had like this tune shader and I turned all the colors off on it and put it in black and white. I'm like oh man that looks just like it's in a manga and like it was originally mm-hmm. a gun and it was going to be like okay there's going to be like a area that's like a detective manga and then I had that, that kind of manga look I had like this sword fighting that wasn't working with the, the shooting and then I didn't really have a good theme for the roguelike so you know you have melee weapons you have like you know a cool comic book look and then you know where, where are you going to go with that samurai, of course? <laughs> First place, you know. And from there, I kind of brought in the uh, the blood effect. I found that on the asset store. I had to kind of tool it around a little bit to get to work in VR. And then um, the first thing I did is I brought, like, a sample scene in, changed it to that style, and locked in. I'm like, oh, my God, this comic book you know, is just amazing. It's like you're in a comic. And, you know, yeah. I added the red in. And at first, like, the AI was real simple. You just kind of tapped them anywhere, and they die. And... Um, once, uh, you know, once we had that f- first prototype going, I really wanted to make it a little more detailed um, rather than you just hitting them anywhere. So that's where I kind of brought it up to the, the newer version. And I used uh, kind of Unity's ragdoll system where it puts colliders all over their body. Added a couple more colliders of my own. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then from there, you just kind of get, get into the physics of it because there's just, it's, it's like a, a rabbit hole you can just keep going down it i still have more like stuff to improve and add on it like uh at first you know i first started to i'm like oh man i saw like stuff like blade and sorcery and that other um i forget the one it's not bone works but the other one you see people a lot with like the guns and they're like jumping and flying everywhere and taking out uh, people's legs pistol whip i think or, or is it another no one? no not pistol whip. it's like a really physics based one but like i was like oh man i'm gonna i was trying to chase after that and i realized like man i'm never gonna i, I don't need to be at that level like because my game has its own yeah. thing so i think i got a pretty good system going um one thing that kind of makes it a little unique is a lot of those games you can just grab the people and chuck them and they're just your victim mm-hmm. whereas a samurai mm-hmm. slaughterhouse they do actually you know they do stand up they do take some hits so like it's right. kind yeah. of a little bit different of a feel so i think it, it, it's okay that it's not you know i don't have <laughs> leg sweeping all this crazy stuff because it does have like, a unique <laughs> feel and it has those rpg features it's really going to give you that that sense of adventure you've been able to explore and find things and stuff. 
Absolutely, absolutely. That's super cool, man. Uh, that's super cool, and and I guess I'm I'm super curious about the physics, right? Like, cause like you know I've worked on a few physics, quite physics based games, but I think Samurai Slaughterhouse is still way more complex than anything I've written. And so I'm like, just how was that like diving into like physics systems and like figuring out how to make um like the melee combat and everything feel good? Like how 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 was that process? Um, it was a little bit of a learning process because. Uh... You know, in the game engine, it has its limits. It's not real life. So <laughs> two things going at each other at a fast rate, even though they would collide mm -hmm. in real life, may not collide mm -hmm. in the Unity engine. So you just got to find ways to work around it. You know, I use, you know, what's called triggers. So it kind of detects mm -hmm. when it gets close to it. Um, and mm -hmm. then, you know, there's things like physics, steps, timing. And then a lot of it, too, is like the more the more you add into it, the more there's like the possibility for crazy stuff to happen. You know, because right. when if you when you play, I don't know if you play this. So when oh, I know you play, but when you play the swords, <laughs> weapons, they get stuck in the enemies, and they it does doesn't uh, actually uh, creates like a dynamic joint, so it's able to right. go in and out. So if you're stabbing yeah. them through the chest and the arm, you know there's a chance like the arm's gonna bend some crazy way, and then you know the more out of control it gets, the more it just kind of builds up momentum until the character just explodes and. Um, <laughs> You know, so you got to build in things to prevent that. Like, you got to be like, you know, if if, these, if the force exceeds this one, then automatically unstab. Or, you know, and then, right. you know, and when something crazy like that happens, it, it detects so many collisions that, like, so much blood spawns that, like, kills the performance. So you have to go in and right. be like, you know, if, if this many blood spawns, you know, within a one second, then stop blood from spawning for two seconds let it like right. catch us so, right. so yeah it's just the, the more you layer on it the more the more craziness happens the more you know the more you have to compensate for it every time you add something you gotta fix the stuff that it breaks or that it's potentially gonna break <laughs> right right yeah, absolutely <laughs> absolutely that makes total sense um and I guess kind of in that vein right like I guess like building like an immersive experience right like the physics are a part of it but I know um, I know you you mentioned before that you have a strong love for music, um, and so uh, the soundtrack for Samurai Slaughterhouse is super dope. I'm a fan, um, and uh, and so I mean I'd love to know like oh, what what are your feelings about audio design, especially in VR, uh, and then um, like making music for like a VR more immersive experience, right? Is that different in any way? Is that is it still similar? Like. So, yeah, I definitely think audio is important. And if I'm being honest, that is one thing that I'm kind of lacking in the game right now. Um, sure. But I do have more sound effects to come. It's just you got to program them in and everything. Okay. So it's a, a whole process. But, yeah, definitely adds a lot to it. Um, I know when I got uh, voice actors to come in my game, um, that's another thing I would say. Like, any developers, get voice actors. There's, there's voice actors out there. Um, they'll do it for cheap. If you're completely broke, there's ones that will do it for free. And it really brings a lot of life to the game, especially with the NPC companions where they're following you around. You know, it's fun having yeah. a little guy that you see, like, attack the enemies, but it's way more fun when he's, like, you know, talking trash and, like, bragging and, <laughs> you know, like, getting into it, like, yeah, and, like, yelling. And it just, it brings so much more life. Like, I just love the voice, you know, what voice acting brings to games. And it's just fun, you know, working with voice actors and you get to give, uh, you know, as any developer that's coming up and I'm kind of getting like my first chance at things, it's kind of nice, you know, working with, uh, you know, small voice actors and giving them, you know, their first chance at like something bigger, like at a, you know, good part. So which is, you know, it's kind of nice to, to spread that love around, <laughs> spread the opportunity mm -hmm. around. Absolutely. Which is, yeah, great. And, um, Have you yeah. Oh, don't. oh, no, and I was just saying, I as far as your other question, like producing music like that, um, that's, that's, that's pretty fun the way that actually started because i have been in bands before i've made music um just for fun as my own you know side project and then uh once i started getting into it you know much like everything else i was just sourcing it finding you know good music packs downloading it and i couldn't get the exact thing you know sound that i wanted so i went on some like kind of message boards and like i found someone that kind of had like a lo-fi type new job is sound wasn't exactly what I wanted, but it was close. And I was like, hey, and like, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, man, I'll give you a great deal. And it was like $50 per song. And I was like, oh, I like three songs. That's $150. Like, and at that point, I only spent like $100 on assets. So I was like, that's more than my whole whole budget up until this point. So that's when I like, uh, on I think it was on Humble Bundle, something popped up with like music production software. And I was like, hey, let me give this a try. So I downloaded it. 
And, uh, you know, it took what I learned from, you know, writing and playing music with regular instruments and just, you know, took that over to the music production, started laying beats and pads and, um, you know, just went from there and it, it just clicked. <laughs> man, yeah. that's awesome, man. Wow. <laughs> and uh, a lot cheaper. I was able to get the sound, you know, exactly what I wanted instead of, you know, somewhat close to what I wanted. And, uh, and right. yeah, I enjoy it, too. Like, sometimes I'll just make songs just for fun, just to blow off steam. But, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome, man. Wow. <laughs> that, oh, wow. <laughs> that's cool, right? And yeah, and, and uh, is it, does it feel any different creating music for like a, a VR space or immersive space? Or is it like still kind of like just making music? Is it, does it all feel the same? You know, when I would say, I mean, just making music for games in general feels like a little different because it does have like a purpose. But I think what really makes it feel different is when you're and just like anything really in vr like what makes it feel different is experiencing it in vr so when i you know when you're making the music it's one thing but then when you hop in it and i think the music just kind of combined with the look gives you like this whole like feel like and then you know depending which of the song is playing which area you're in sometimes it's like a nice you know fuzzy feel mm -hmm. and you just want to sometimes you just want to relax like there, there's times where i just kind of went in the game and just went up to like a a rail in the game i mean you can't really lean on it but i just kind of like pretended i was leaning on it and just looked over a cliff and just, just enjoying the view vibing to the music like it you know it, it's you know i made mean, it that's what i like about it. i feel like it's a space too that you know you can only go around and kill people but you can't just like sit around and chill in it and um i think i would do want to add some like mini games to help facilitate that where you can just be like chilling and doing little things <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's super dope, man. That's super dope. Yeah, I was thinking to myself earlier, I was like, if I had to imagine what like living in like a samurai shampoo universe would be, I think it would be this, right? Like that I th it would feel like what I think it feels like to play Samurai Slaughterhouse. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I was going for. That's like my main inspiration. Definitely the soundtrack too. Like, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Yeah, were, were there like a lot of them? Um, a lot of, uh, I guess, yeah. So, were you mostly like, influenced by anime? Were mostly influenced by movies? Was it a, uh, um, like, yeah? What, like, what, what did influence like Samurai Slaughter House? Yeah, a lot of animes. Uh, like, as far as the themes goes, definitely animes. Uh, like, Samurai Champloo is a big one. Afro Samurai was one that mm -hmm. I liked a lot. Um, you know, as far as movies go, a little bit. You know, I like the Kurosawa films. I like the look from those. Mm -hmm um mm -hmm. kind of thematically like kill bill like the, like kind of like yeah. grindhouse films i like those uh and i kind of just like uh like this, the tarantino films how he's kind of just like in your face like it's unapologetic <laughs> and that's just how i just want to be with it just you know slaughterhouse and then right <laughs> blood flying everywhere and yeah i just, just wanted it to be brutal like that and then as far as uh game, game influences uh you know besides the obvious ones like bushido blade you know, way to samurai. I mean, mm -hmm. Bushido Blade was a big one because I liked how that one kind of focused on hitting critical yeah. spots, which, you know, definitely works in like in a flat game. But really, when you're playing in VR, having to aim and yeah. hit critical spots and counter, like it, it just means so much more because you're actually aiming it yourself yeah. and you're able to, to give that control to the player. You know, those are yeah. my biggest influences. And then also Halo a little bit. Uh, you know, if you saw like, you know, the game has like a faction system where uh, a regular human enemy sees a monster mm -hmm. enemy they're not just going to go mm -hmm. after you they're going to fight each other you know they got their own agenda mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know that's what i liked about halo is it kind of made it feel like a living world and i want to bring that to by making it a, a nice open interactive sandbox where you kind of never know what's going to happen right. <laughs> right. yeah i think uh the first time i ran into a samurai in game yeah i was just like wandering and just saw this dude whacking at this plant creature i was like whoa and i was like is he, like is he aggro towards me because i wasn't sure if like Maybe he was on my team, and of course I walked. Uh, I walked too close to him, and he started swinging at me too. <laughs> <laughs> but such is life, right? Never know who's your friend. <laughs> there we go there we go <laughs> oh man and that's really cool I, I definitely think uh when i was playing i noticed that um it was really uh i think the best like all the the really the sword fighting games i've really enjoyed like they have that like moment of intensity like a swing like feels intense right and i think bushido blade is a great example like every blow in bushido blade could be a death blow 
um, or it could just be a blow that really maims you. But like, it felt like every blow had an impact, right? And so I definitely appreciated like playing Samurai Slaughterhouse. There was like a headspace that I got into when like the combat starts. Like, oh, okay, it's on, right? Like <laughs> that time I keep a sword. It's time. It's go time, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's one of the most important things, too, about um, not just, like, combat in games, but really any games in general is what you know, we call use, user feedback, um, which is whenever the user does something, something's got to happen. Like, And um, a lot of people, when they're first prototyping their games, they leave that off. They're like, you know, that's polished, that's towards the end. But I say put it in right away. Like, even if you're going to change that particle effect, even if you're not going to keep the screen splash, if you're not going to keep that sound, just throw it in because it, it feels good. And that's what's right. going to, you know, sell your game. That's when it's going to convince people that it feels good. And, uh, you know, when the time comes, you got to send it to investors. You got to send it to publishers. You know, if they play your game, even if your game is just pushing a button, as long as something exciting happens and you push that button, then, you know, yeah. that's going to make people feel happy and to make them feel excited. So, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever you do in the game, you know, reward the player give them a, a nice little effect in my game it's the blood that's the, that, that's the effect <laughs> the blood and the, and the nasty wet stabbing noises like especially yeah. when you stab someone when you pull out it's like and it's like oh, you can just like hear that blood like coming. I think, like the sound is actually worse than the visual <laughs> right <laughs> Oh, I love that. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, that's awesome. Um, and he, I think that leaves a good note, right? Like, I guess you're talking about, like, general experience building. And so uh, one thing while I was, like, reading more about you and, like, your background and all that, um, like, reading that you've been, like, a, like, hobbyist game dev since you were 10, which is super impressive. I know you, you just recently um, started really formulating your team and studio for Samurai Slaughterhouse. So I'd love to, like, hear about how you got started in games and like um i guess coming up to this point and kind of the decision to go full-time game dev or indie dev but um but i'd love to like know starting like developing games at 10 that's pretty impressive right like that's awesome yeah so i started out like i just loved video games and i i love creating stuff like when i was a kid i would make comics and you know staple them and <laughs> other stuff like that yeah. anything i could make i would i would um, try to make my own candy, which was just frozen grapes, but then I would, like, package them and staple it. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, I was into video games, into creating, so that was, of course, things I wanted to do, so, you know, it took a while to find something I could actually do, so I was playing around with level editors, make my own levels. I tried a few. I remember using this one weird RPG maker that ran games in DOS, and I could barely figure out how to work it, so I just, you basically walked around and fought all these aliens that looked like E.T., and you had to find, like, these gems, and it was it didn't make any sense but the, i think the first real like actual like success where i was really able to like you know think of something and make it was when i downloaded like click and play um uh, which they had this one called click and play for schools which had a free license and basically the deal was you can make whatever you want for free on it as long as you don't sell it um and this was back in the days of windows 3.1 and dial-up internet so there is no way i was going to sell my own game anyway <laughs> because <laughs> you know <laughs> it's hard enough to make like a website you know and half the people don't have internet you know you got to put it on like those thousand yeah. game free cds and hope they register it you know <laughs> i don't know if you if you're as old as me but i back then they used to have these cds you download there's like a thousand free sharewares and like it would let you play the first two levels and it was like oh register the game and then you can play the rest and it was like some kind of complicated thing and then the developer gives you a code so you mm -hmm. unlock the rest of the game like that was that was how indie games were <laughs> dispersed back then. So, you, you know, there's no no problem with the fact that I couldn't sell it. I'd just be happy if I put it up and someone downloaded it. But, you know, from there, I would use, use that. I would make, like, platformers, overhead things, um, kind of, like, simplified RTS things. It was, like, little, real simple, like, 2D stuff you can make with it. Um, you know, from there, I got into RPG Maker 2. Um, which RPG mm -hmm. Maker, a lot of people look down on it, but I, I say, hey, if you can make a cool game in it, that's awesome, because uh, right. definitely most of my programming skills, I would say, I learned from RPG Maker, because even though you weren't programming it, you kind of click things, it still had, you know, if-else statements, you had, like, booleans and, like, integers oh you can save. So, you know, other than typing, you were able to do all the programming stuff. Um, and it was pretty cool, because I, 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 when I would use these limited engines, what I would like to do is see what kind of weird things I could do with them. So with RPG Maker, I made a kind of Pokemon clone. We were able to, you know, the enemies that popped up at random, you are able to use what I call a leash, because I don't want to steal the football idea. So you'd use the leash and weaken them, and then you can capture them. 
and then I join your that. party. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then I liked uh, from there, uh, kind of stopped developing games for a while, you know, got into music, did a little bit of tattooing and graphic design artwork, some other stuff. And then um, what, what actually got me back into is I found out that the, the engine that was used to make Doom and Doom 2 was open source and anyone could just download and use it. And I just loved like the aesthetic of those type of games. Um, just kind of the 3D made with 2D sprites. So I started making it, download that, making a game in it. And, um, you know, it's a pain in the ass. Like, I'm like, oh, they don't make games like this anymore. And it's like, well, there's a reason for that. Like, <laughs> like I made like one enemy and it's like 40 sprites. <laughs> so like, I'm like, this is crazy. And then um, well, and I, I made like a custom UI for it. And when you make the UI, it's not like Unity where you drag it in, you stretch it. Like you actually have to count the number of pixels and stretch like these images you have to trick the system basically because doom doesn't have like a custom ui it has a printing system where it prints letters so you replace the sprite the letter the sprite of the letter with whatever you know ui sprite you want then you tell it to print it on a certain place so i made this whole ui and then i found out that my icons that i made for items were too low res you couldn't read the description on them so then i had to rechange the resolution resize everything and at the same time um there was a thing to learn Unity, like on Humble Bundle. You know, like, I love Humble Bundle. Mm -hmm. That's why I pick up so much stuff. But mm -hmm. I picked up that, mm -hmm. and one of the first lessons is how to make a UI, and you just drag the thing on there, click where you want it to orient, so it automatically reorients for every like resolution. You know, you don't have to do mm -hmm. all that manually. So I was like, why am I using this thirty-year-old engine like to make games when I can make something <laughs> modern? So I started playing around with that, and then uh, I started hearing about like the Oculus, you know, Rift and the Oculus Quest. And then it was right around the time when uh, Virtual Desktop, I don't, I don't think Virtual Desktop just came out, but just added the feature to let you play Steam games with it. Um, and I originally wanted Rift S, and it was sold out everywhere. It turns out I was better off getting the Quest because it's standalone and PC VR and wireless. So I um, ended up getting a Quest. I had to get it from a scalper because it was sold out everywhere. Paid an extra hundred bucks. <laughs> but, you know, I brought that home, played Vader Immortal, you know, fell in love with VR. Um, yeah. And then... You know, from there, I just started, I'm mean, like, we make a VR game. I started taking some tutorials, and um, that's when I started on that roguelike, uh, yeah. which I made a lot of systems from scratch that I found out I could have just bought a framework that would have done for me, but it, <laughs> a good, good learning experience. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, then from there, it's, you know, the history. From there, I made Slash Top on Samurai. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, um, as far as transitioning to full-time indie dev, so I was working full-time. I had a full-time job. Um, I would come home and work on Samurai Slaughterhouse pretty much from when I get home until um, I got off, until I started working from home as, as an office, like, because my COVID, everything closed. So, you know, I work my eight-hour job from home, and then as soon as I'm done, I can hop on Samurai, and then um, sometimes my lunch breaks, or if, you know, work was slow, I can pretend like I'm doing their work and do my own work. But, uh, you know, just in my free time, I worked on it, built it up, um, you know, just posted like crazy, Reddit, Twitter, um, you know, until I started getting the attention of publishers and then finally, you know, investors um, started talking. And then, uh, you know, from there, I was able to, to get the investment needed to uh, quit my full time job. And now I'm starting to bring on other team members um, to help, you know, take it to the next level and get it knocked out. So pretty excited that's, about it. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, man. And that's I mean, uh, kudos to you. Right. Like, it's awesome. I love, you know, seeing you get a. Um, featured in articles and stuff, right? It's good to see um, all the people who, like, love seeing your game and watching it. Um, and then, you know, finally having a chance to play it. Like, it was fun to experience it for myself because, like, it's um, absolutely worth all the excitement. So uh, you're doing great work. And uh, I guess uh, to go along with that, right, I'd have to ask, right, like, uh, if you had any advice to give to, like, the other indie developers out there, right, because you know it's, it can be gr a grind to work on your game, especially, like, when there's not attention, there is no... Um, publisher talk or anything right and like you stuck with your game even so so would you have any advice um, for somebody who's like you know they're trying to do like stick with their day job and take care of their game and like they might feel like it's a little bit hopeless but clearly you made it work so would there be any like words of wisdom you'd, you'd want to offer to people in that situation or encouragement or yeah absolutely so i would say um you know the biggest thing is just to keep at it keep posting um, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you post something and only 10 people like it, don't get discouraged. You know, the more, the more you post, the more chance of people have to see it, the more it's going to snowball, the more it's going to get bigger. Um, I would say, you know, take advice where you can watch GDC talks, depending on what your day job is. 
if you can get away with watching GDC talks on YouTube while you're working, do it. Uh, <laughs> there's one speech that I would definitely advise, which is called Pizzazz Not Polished. And that was kind of where I got that thing about getting in those, you know, particle effects, getting in that user feedback in right away. Because um, that is what's going to sell your game. You got to you gotta make it look fun. Um, right. Take that time out to, to make it look good. Uh, you know, if you only have one little thing working and set up a, a good looking scene and, um, you know, only show that little part of it that looks good and do what you need to do to make a good clip. Because, uh, you know, people will be like, wow, this looks so well polished. It looks so done. I'm like, well, you're just seeing this this one little piece that I'm showing you. So, um, you know, that's important. Like, you know, mock up your scenes. Like before I had um, like a title screen, and a way to spawn it and everything, um, I would just drag the player controller on the place I thought would be a cool place to fight, like on a roof and drag a couple enemies on a roof uh, just to record mm -hmm. clips, you know? Right. And, uh, you know, I record some clips in the beginning of the week and just, you know, post them throughout the week. Um, so, you know, just keep posting away. And then um, I would say, and some people look at me funny when I say this, but don't be afraid to spend a little bit of money. Don't be afraid to hit that asset store or buy stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, any hobby you have, you know, even if you just look at it as a hobby, uh, any hobby you have, you're going to spend money. So, I mean, you know, think about how much money you spend on other hobbies. If people spend on hobbies, you know, spending, you know, 20, 30 bucks on like a, a framework that's going to help you out. Even like 80 bucks. Like if you, if it's going to do 90% of the work for you, that's going to save you, you know, weeks. So, you know, <laughs> the, the, don't be afraid to, to bust out the money. And um, if you can't, you know, if you can't afford that. Uh, you know, there's lots of free assets too. You can look, you know, browse the Unity Asset Store, see what you can use for free if that's all you can afford. Um, you know, look at like places like Sketchfab, CG Trader. Uh, you know, there's free models on there and there's cheap models. So, you know, if you don't want to spend money at first, you can, you know, be cheap, use free stuff. Uh, but yeah, I would say it definitely wouldn't hurt, especially if, if uh, there's like a framework that's going to do most of the work for you. I use one called Hurricane VR. It does a lot of the work. Uh, you know, if you could spend $60 and get, you know, weeks ahead of where you were, why not do it? <laughs> you know, pull the trigger. Yeah. All right. Yeah, save yourself the time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You get, get your game going, you know, do what you got to do to get it out there. Um, with my mm -hmm. game, I, I made the first prototype. I ended up almost scrapping the whole thing, just starting over from scratch. But mm -hmm. um, now I would say don't be afraid to do that, too. You may be into your game and you're like, man, I've been working on this for four months. And, you know, I should have done this differently. I should have done this differently. Don't be afraid to start over. It's not going to take you four months to get back to where you are. Um, it's probably going to take two, three weeks. Like, because you already know what you're doing. You know what you want to do. You want to have a plan. You know, all your assets are probably still going to carry over. Um, you can easily get back to where you were if you have to start from scratch. So I would say don't be afraid to do that. If, once you have your, once you're going and you realize <laughs> things you should have done differently. <laughs> Uh, yeah, for sure. That makes a ton of sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of like, yeah, especially for indie devs, right? I think it's hard to get momentum when you're making your game. And I think so many people, they get trapped and like, oh, I can't build this thing from scratch. And like, they almost kill their own momentum. And I think exactly what you said, like going to the asset store, sometimes that's been the spark plug for me to finish like a project. So um, yeah. Yeah, actually, I don't know if you saw, but I posted like this racing game recently. And that mm -hmm. took like two, three hours because I just pulled stuff. I didn't even have to buy it because I had stuff already sitting around from Humble Bundles. So I was like, you yeah. know, I, how that happened is I was like, you know, I want to drive around in the city in VR. Hmm. And I'm like, what car games are there? And I was like, you know, these are all racetrack racing games. I just want to casually drive around. So I was like, let's see what we got. We got this uh, city generator. We got this vehicle controller. Let's download the, um, you know, OVR kit. Put a mm -hmm. VR camera in here. You know, I just stabilized the car because it kept spinning out. And then, you know, from there, you know, two, three hours, I was free driving around in the city someone uh on twitter was like hey you should uh put people we could run over in there i'm like yeah that's not a bad idea so you know i took a, <laughs> an ai toolkit uh like a really simple one that told the ai where to walk around and i added something on the car that that activated the ragdoll once the car hit him and you know, from there another another 45 minutes we had a pedestrian in there and um, right. sometimes you know just do what you gotta do to, to crack it out i mean even if I do advance on that, I probably will completely replace that AI system because um, it's what I'm using in Samurai and I ended up having to pull it apart so much that it doesn't even make sense to use now. Um, so I'll probably just make my own for like that card game. But I mean, just to get it in, get it going, show it to people, um, you know, that's what's important because you got to gotta make it look good right away. You know, in your head, you know, it may look good, but you got to make it, you know, look good in videos. You got to make it look good on clips because that's what people are going to see. And, um, yeah. 
they can't they can't see your ideas in your head so you gotta even if it's just a small piece of it you have to have like a complete small piece that you can show so uh, you know don't worry about making everything worry about making you know at least when you start about what we'll make worry about making the best thing to show off to people <laughs> that's awesome absolutely that makes uh, perfect sense to me that makes perfect sense to me um and and i think um to kind of go i mean to go back to um a little bit about like you know starting your own studio right like it's clear you have a very you have a talent for making games right you know exactly what you're doing in that space and i know i had challenges kind of trying to start my own studio and i guess ask like i'm, I'm curious to hear about your experience like starting an indie studio is how is that different from um i guess just making a game right like does, does it feel different to you is it the same thing um like how, how does that feel like beginning an indie studio um so definitely more paperwork <laughs> than i expected a lot more meetings a lot more paperwork it's uh you know a lot of not development stuff which i i wasn't quite expecting but hey it's, it's part of it um but i think it is definitely a challenge giving people things to do, directing them. Um, so it, it's still something I'm kind of coming into and learning. So I'll have to <laughs> come back to you on a lot of that. But uh, For sure. yeah, yeah, I don't think it's too bad. I think it's the benefits are like amazing. I brought on uh, Jeff Bull. He was the uh, just part time contracting. He helped with some doing some shaders. He got the app space warp going. Um, you know, I had to learn how to use plastic SCM. He actually taught me how to use that. That mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, I was using Unity Teams before, which you know, it was convenient because it was built into Unity, but once I started using plastic, I was like, man, Unity Teams is crap. Like, I wasn't using that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it has been, like, a learning experience, learning how to collaborate using, like, those, uh, you know, Git or whatever, you know, using, um, you know, and then just learning how to work with people, tell them, you know, what, what they need to do. Uh, so, yeah, it's a little bit of a challenge, but excited about how, how it's going to come out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. And definitely a... I'm sure, like, it feels better to have, like, other people carrying the load of, like, delivering the game, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then, because there's, uh, you know, only so much stress one person can handle. <laughs> you know, and then, yeah, and then, like I said, I bring on a writer. I'm pretty excited about that because, like, that's uh, one area that I found that I'm, I'm struggling with and lacking. Um, you know, I can put this cool feel, but as far as, like, putting to words, like, the context of it and coming up with all the, the little ins and outs of it, uh, I'm having a little bit harder time with, so I'm pretty excited about having a writer. So it kind of brings some more talent in. Um, and this writer has worked on everything from like roguelikes to kind of like Harvest Moon type sims. So I think they're really going to bring a fresh perspective. Um, so they can be more to the game other than just you know blood and killing. <laughs> so they can bring some emotion to it. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> that's awesome man um and that's great and i love even hearing how like you already kind of have like a i guess a vision of like i guess a more well-rounded samurai slaughterhouse not just focused on like your cornerstone qualities right like figuring out how to continue to make sure it grows and evolves into like a more full experience yeah absolutely and i think um that's one of the advantages of having a studio is you can really um you know fill in those those cracks where you're you're not you know quite able to do it um you know because no one no one's going to be able to do everything no one's going to be good at everything um right. so kind of recognizing what you're good at focusing on that and uh not being afraid to, to hand off some of it uh you know it's important it's a, it's, it's a relief and it'll be a better product in the end because it's uh right. you know the more the more you have contributing the, the, the greater it's going to be because everyone's going to have their own you know bit of specialness that they're going to add to it which is you know even even the voice actors, even just their parts, the way they play the parts really just you know, makes it something unique that it wouldn't have been without what that person added to it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very cool, man. I love I love hearing it. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, and uh, I guess you mentioned like <laughs> talking about no one's good at everything, right? Um, but one thing I'm, I'm super impressed by you and like you're a lot better than a lot of people I know who've worked on games for a while your marketing skills are off the charts. Like, I, I don't know too many people who can make a viral clip as, as common as you do. Um, and so I guess, you know, I'd love to hear, like, as far as, like, indie game marketing, right? Like, what would what what is what is your approach to that? And, like, what are, you know, I know you can't tell us all your secrets, but um, <laughs> kind of what are, um, 
what what are like the things that you think are most important or things you don't think enough indie uh, creators do um yeah like i mean what what's your perspective you're really good at it and um yeah yeah so i would say um a lot of people are afraid oh i don't want to bother people i don't want to spam them just spam mm -hmm. them post two three times a day if you got to you know worst case scenario they're going to scroll past your video and not click the little heart button but you know pro chances are they're not going to see every one of your videos you're going to post and you know maybe if they saw them all they'd love them but the only way they're going to see it is if you post 20 so that they can see one of them so you know don't be afraid to spam stuff um you know post a lot when i met with the devigo people which i think they're the pros at marketing if you look at their patreon numbers it's insane like off the charts like they they can run their whole studio just off patreon and i'm like how do you guys do it and they're like we put and i don't know this isn't my advice this is what they told me and it's not what i'm doing but they told every one of their employers to put 50 percent of their time into marketing half is development half is marketing so that is crazy but apparently it's working for them so right. um i don't know i can't afford to put that much into marketing but um hopefully now i'll be able to bring on like a, a dedicated community manager um, yeah, post a lot, post frequently, um, and, and like I said, just make things specifically for the clips. Like if your your level isn't ready, um, but there's part of it's ready, then just drag the player controller to the part of it that's ready. If your enemy spawning isn't set up yet, just drag the enemies into the scene. No one's gonna know. <laughs> um, you know, don't be afraid to fake stuff. You know, if you um, if you're working on something and you don't have anything to post, just post um, you know what you have so far. Like if I'm adding a new enemy into the game i don't have him set up yet but i have his i have him retextured i have a few animations for him i'll say hey check out this new enemy i'm working on and i'll just you know put the camera there and then uh you know trigger his animations of him swinging it so it looks like he's he's doing something in the game and even though he's not a full working enemy i'm able to, to get that out there people are saying hey that looks awesome that looks cool and then um and then you can follow it up hey i got this enemy you know finally working here's him fighting um so you know, don't be afraid to post your stuff that's a work in progress. Um, if you do have like a empty room and there's only two things in it, but those two things look cool, be like, hey, here's here's my work in progress. These are these two mm -hmm. things that are cool. And people actually love that. You know, point out what you're working on. When I first added the blood, I didn't have it um, working on the end. I didn't have the enemy AI working, so they just kind of stood there and let you stab them. But the blood spray looks so cool, and because that's what I was focusing the post on, like, hey, look at this blood. And people looked at the blood and were like, wow, that blood is amazing. And that post mm -hmm. actually did better than ones where the enemy's fully working. I'm just like, hey, look at my game. And, you know, yeah. even some people are like, wow, that blood looks amazing. Because the post mm -hmm. isn't about the blood, that's not, you know, picking it up. So, you know, anytime you're making something new, if it just barely works, but it looks cool, um, right. you know, just get it working long enough to record that clip. You know, if you gotta, <laughs> you gotta record a 10 minute clip to get like, you know, 30 seconds of working footage, then you know, just do what you got to do to make those clips. And then, um, you know, once you do have a good going, if you have, you know, once you have gameplay, especially if you have any physics gameplay where things are acting funny, um, where crazy things can happen, um, just record your play test while you're testing it. Just record it. Um, and then during the week, you have like footage. You can go be like, hey, I have this clip where I, you know, knock this guy off the cliff and it looks good. Or, you know, I, I threw this you know sword and it bounced off and stuck in someone like. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't say how many times, like, I, I wish I was recording because super funny stuff <laughs> happened in the game. Like, oh, that's never got Like, the other time, I uh, when you open, like, a chest, it kind of spawns a bunch of coins out. And the last mm -hmm. thing to pop out is the item that's in the chest. And I had a ninja star pop out. And when it flew out, an enemy was walking by and it landed his head and killed him. <laughs> and it was, like, the best thing. But I wasn't recording. And I was like, no, why? And, like, oh, uh, it's a... Uh, <laughs> Record your playtest. You never know what's happening because that, that could be footage that you like can't get back. <laughs> you can't recreate. Like, <laughs> oh man, that sounds perfect. Wow. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, it's a bummer that wasn't recorded. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, one of your players is able to recreate something similar. But that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, uh, very cool, man. And uh, I guess, like you know, talking about like you know, uh, social media and being able to share your game and show the exciting moments, right? Um, congrats on winning the summer pitch a game uh, competition, right? Uh, I think uh, I know you're one of the top three submissions for sure. And I, I guess I would love to hear about, like, um, you know, how was it winning that? How how did you go about winning it? Um, for people who might be um, looking to participate in the next Pitchy Game competition, would you have any advice for them? Or uh, Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So um, 
getting ready for that, um, which was also a great excuse to try to make a good trailer, uh, was I, I did make a video specifically for that. Um, and when you're, it's, uh, I mean, it's more to it than that, but the biggest part of it, the main chunk of what it actually is, is a trailer contest. I don't want to say that because Liam and the Pitcher Game people are going to get mad at me, but <laughs> your trailer is like the most important thing. And um, make your trailer, you know, make it a specifically into a trailer. Don't just throw a bunch of clips in there and throw whatever background music. Um, I make music, so I made a song specifically for the trailer that um, was the length I wanted it, which I think was like 45 seconds or 50 seconds. Um, but, you know, if you don't have the ability to do that, just go out and find a song um find a song that is you know only 30 seconds to like a minute long you don't want to make a long trailer people are gonna you know lose interest or they're gonna lose their attention um so you know pick a song for the trailer if the song is two minutes long figure out a good place to cut it off um, and then make your trailer when you're making your trailer um keep every clip as short as possible is my advice like if you want to show an enemy getting stabbed don't show the player walking up to him and stabbing him just skip to the part where you stab them and move on to the next thing. And then um, make sure, and then just, just keep in mind, if the, the, the person watching gets bored, they're going to skip it. So don't let them get bored. Um, I've seen some developers, when they do their trailer, they'll put mm -hmm. the first third of the trailers, the first level, then there's another 30 seconds of like another level. Uh, don't do that, because if they only watch the first 15 seconds and they get bored, they're going to think the whole game looks the same. Whereas if they, you know, fast forward and got to the end of it, they would have seen that there's all these different, you know, zones and worlds. So assume that they may not watch the whole thing. So make sure whatever you want to show them, get it in the beginning. If it's your, for me, it was the stylized look. So that's, you know, pretty much any footage I'm going to show is going to get that off. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's your combat system, if you have some kind of crazy driving system, get that in within the first few seconds. And mm -hmm. um, this is common advice. Some people still ignore it. Uh, don't put your studio name up front. Don't put a long splash screen. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, no one knows who Tab Games is. No mm -hmm. one's going to care. No one's going to see that in the beginning of the trailer and get excited. You know, it's not Bethesda. You're not like, oh, it's a new Bethesda game. Like, mm -hmm. but if you got to put that in, put it at the end uh, after your title. The number one important thing is the title of your game. And then, if, mm -hmm. you know, put your studio name in the corner or somewhere. But, uh, no one knows who you are it's not going to sell your game <laughs> um throw it in there at the end like it's not <laughs> and um yeah and that's just the biggest thing you know keep, keep your clips short and make sure you show them what you want to show them in the beginning of the trailer and then put the extra stuff at the end you know if they get around to it if they're extra interested but, and keep your trailer short you know 30 seconds to a minute the less is more my best trailer i think was 10 or 15 seconds and it was just doom, doom. Wow. <laughs> like it was just like you know the taiko drums and like a, a guy making a noise at the end and that was like in my opinion my best trailer because it was just so fast and snappy like uh, right so yeah just wow. just keep, keep keep it short show them what you got to show them and show it to them quick don't let them get bored <laughs> man that's awesome and it's such a it's a really interesting point right because i think people assume like Oh, 50, a 15 second video, anybody's going to watch a 15 second video, but I've definitely watched videos and been three seconds in like, nope, skip, right? And so <laughs> you, make a really, you make a really compelling point, like you can bore someone in a very small amount of time. So making sure that what is there is fast and effective, I think that's super valuable, right? Yeah, especially on social media, because they're scrolling. If it doesn't catch their attention, they're on to the next thing. Like it, they, they got something, you know, loaded and ready to go, so. Um, right. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta catch him. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely, man. Um, and that's awesome. But yeah, so we're uh, we're starting to near the end, and so I think um, I guess some of the final questions. Uh, one of the final questions I wanted to definitely ask was, um, you know, I, I think um, uh, Samurai Slaughterhouse is such a, um, um, I guess I won't say that. I was about to say like an intensely physical game, and it's physical. It's not intensely physical, but I guess. I guess when I think about the game, right, the idea of this sword fight, it feels very physical, it feels very intense. And so my question's more like, are there any limitations to VR that you think are kind of holding Samurai Slaughterhouse back right now? Like, are there any advancements for, like, VR hard hardware, the Quest specifically, you'd, like, hope to see in the future that would make for a better experience? I would love to see some kind of foot tracking that works with the Quest natively. 
and is mm -hmm. you know easy to get your hands on not too expensive because um i mean just imagine like because right now you can stab the people but you can't kick them so you know if you were to stab someone they already get stuck on your sword you can pick your foot up and kick them off the sword <laughs> that would just be absolutely amazing so like uh i just think like foot tracking would be great um mm -hmm. But I think as far as, like, other than that, at least for, for my game, it's not really held back too much by that because, um, you know, it is a big open world, so you have to use artificial movement unless you have, like, a, a football field somewhere to play in. But, I mean, even then, I guess there's hills and stuff, so that wouldn't even work. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think uh, right now, at least surprisingly, it hasn't been held back by hardware, including the quest. I had to, you know, kill the shadows in a few areas, but surprisingly, the, the quest has a little a good kick to it, as they know to get it running well on there <laughs> right absolutely absolutely um and then um yeah that's awesome man and i i guess uh as far as like you know vr as vr as like a a, a space continues to evolve right all the metaverse hype all the um renewed interest i hear that this this christmas was huge for the quest especially um in vr in general the psvr 2 just got announced right um, I guess, is there anything you're really excited about in the space? And then, like, as far as, like, how VR is evolving, right, do you have any feelings or observations about how you think it's going to continue to change and grow? Or um, yeah. So I'm definitely excited about influx of new users and that um, it is getting out, it's being seen. Everyone's excited about being, I think it was on Jimmy Fallon. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I just it's just cool that everyone's, like, hearing about it, everyone notices it. Dorothy, uh, my wife, uh, one of her, her work friends actually picked up a quest and she doesn't even play video games, but she, she did it. She fell in love with it. And yeah. uh, that's what I like about it. It's kind of like the, the Wii of VR yeah. that anyone can just pick it up and enjoy it. Um, you know, the Wii had people that would never buy games before, people that are way older that, you know, video games were part of their generation. But, you know, they wanted to, to bowl whenever they wanted. And this is the same thing, you know. <laughs> The people that, you know, they want to get out, they want to fish whenever they want, they want to bowl whenever they want, they want to golf, you know, whatever they want to do, they want to get in there and play that, you know, it's coming to everyone. And that's, um, that's awesome because video games have always been kind of for video game people with, with you know, a few exceptions. Like I said, there's the Wii, uh, you know, Pac-Man craze, but for the most part, there's, you know, people that are into video games, people that do it and, you know, people that don't. But I think this is kind of bridging the gap um bring it all together getting people to play games that normally wouldn't uh and then that'll also open up more opportunities for you know more developers to bring games into vr and uh as far as i think it's going to evolve i think we'll see um definitely more power on the standalone systems uh there's some disagreement on this but i think we will see a lot more of the uh systems where the processing itself is separated from the headset because right now, mm -hmm. one of the limitations for the Quest is not even how powerful the chip is. The problem is that it gets too hot inside the headset, um, mm -hmm. and they can't cool it. So even if they were to, say, make a, a VR backpack that connects to the headset, just having the right. processor and the, the battery in the backpack alone will give it more power. You know, mm -hmm. But if you're able to have something as big, you know, your Xbox One, you know, the Xbox right. One X, it's like this big. But, mm -hmm. you know, no one cares because it's, it's not on your back. It's not on your face. Okay. So I think when, we, well, we're, when we're going to see VR really take a big leap is when um, separate VR consoles that connect wirelessly to the HMV, um, right. you know, are more prevalent. I, I think, you know, we're going to see some of that with the PSVR 2. Um, yeah. I'm a little concerned, though, because it's stock, you know, no one's able to get a hold of yes. them. Um, sure. With the Quest, one of the big advantages, and some people want to deny this, um i don't have to deny it <laughs> part of the reason for the success of the quest was everything else was sold out on christmas so people had no choice but to buy it but hey i'll take it like whatever whatever triggers that boom i'll take it you know i don't have to lie and be like no it's not because that's because vr is so awesome it's like vr is awesome but you know we can admit that that's that got a lot of people into it and hey that, that's what it takes we'll go from there because uh right. you know vr it's always been awesome but no one's ever heard of it no one no one knew about it. Like up until a couple years ago, when I bought my Quest. Um, the only VR I did was in a museum, and it looked like, you know, Quest World and Johnny Quest like they <laughs> blew it away. Like, I was like, this is like <laughs> Quest, but I could barely turn around and look yeah. at things. Like, and then, uh, you know, now now fast forward, it, it's you know, it's basically what we imagine as kids. It's like you're really there, but just people don't know about it. So, 
I think you know, yeah. whatever it takes to get that word out, that's uh, yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> It's absolutely, absolutely right. The adoption's still adoption, right? Yeah. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, well that's awesome, Justin, and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. So um, I guess, um, like uh, you know, I guess now uh, before we go, right? Would you have any closing remarks? And if people want to follow you, follow your platform, follow Slam- Samurai Slaughterhouse. Uh, where can they catch you? Where can they follow you and uh, follow you for more? Yeah, absolutely. So you can follow me um, on Twitter. It's at TabGames3. And um, I also have a website, which is TabGamesVR.com. Uh, and there's links there uh, to my Patreon. If you want to go on there, it has like my games, uh, my work in progress games, as well as artwork and uh, music. Uh, and you can support you know, the development of great VR games. Uh, I'll probably be putting up uh, some tutorials soon. A lot of people were asking about that car game and how I made it in like two hours. So I'll show you how to make it in 30 minutes since you know most of those two hours of me figuring stuff out and it's already figured mm-hmm. out now so i'll be putting that up um and i just want to say yeah if you're thinking about developing for vr uh just go out and do it download unity download the free frameworks play around with it um you know just get on and do it don't do don't waste your time doing research um uh, just mm-hmm. get out there and play figure out what you want to do and then you know then you could do your research but uh, <laughs> don't, don't let anyone stop you from from hopping into Unity and playing around. Or Unreal if you want. Not trying to push Unity, but uh, You're right. more people use <laughs> Unity. It makes it easier. You know, it's just me and Johnny here knowing real people so we can say whatever you want. No one can argue with us. Right. If you're on Unity and you have a problem, you can search on the internet and someone will have the answer. You cannot say the same with Unreal. That's all I gotta say is that there's a community out there and you can get the help you need with Unity. You can find the stuff you need on the asset store. There's the tutorials are there. Uh, we get the SDKs first. Like, <laughs> I don't care if Unity is if Unreal is a better engine. Unity is just better to use, like in my opinion. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to disagree with you. But <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Justin. It's been a pleasure, man. And um, I can't wait to see more Samurai Slaughterhouse in the future. Um, this has been Zero to Play, and thank you all for watching. Yeah. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Zero to Play podcast. I hope you learned something about game development, the games industry as a whole, or the future of games. You can follow us on Twitter at Zero to Play, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Spotify, or any other podcasting service. Other than that, you can find links to this episode down in the description below, and I'll see you guys next week for the next episode.